So we've had a whole day of discussion about how work is changing, motivation, uh, measurement, analysis, um, and we've sort of assumed all through this that there's underlying technology that's supporting this. And so we're not going to get into the, some of the obvious stuff in terms of, you know, broadband and, and telepresence and iPads and mobility. But I do think that there are two interesting sort of technical uh, or tools discussions that are, are, are worth um, talking about a little bit. The one is um, just what are the types of tools that enable collaboration? So in, in, in Sanan's world, he was looking at, at email, but we've moved quite far beyond email. And in fact, I've talked to more than one person whose teams have said, we've dispensed with email and we're using something else. We're using something that looks like a Facebook wall. We're using something that looks like a Twitter feed. So that's interesting uh, in terms of how do we think about collaboration. And the other side is, again, to Sanan's point, is related to measurement. So what happens when I can sit in the background and observe a lot more about how people interact? And not only that, but actually, what's the result? Right? So if I can observe a group of people going back and forth to discuss a problem and then see how good the result is, and I can do that lots and lots of times, I can start to tease out who is very productive in that group, you know, who is, is impacting the overall results. And so that's an interesting, uh, it makes, you know, sort of the tools enable more interesting analysis. So final panel I'm going to introduce is going to talk um, a little bit about those two points, about tools that enable collaboration and tools that are enabli enabling us to measure and evaluate uh, individuals and teams. Why don't you go there, Neil? Okay. Um. Awesome. You guys here? Oh, man, these are. Uh, right, do we uh, get our, our cups? We need our cups. Oh, it's a comfortable chair. Yeah. It's a rocking chair. Awesome. All right, so who's up for single malt scotch? Oh, all right. <laughs> Tony? Uh, sure, I'll try it. Just a tiny bit. Thanks, thanks. Wow. Okay. No. I'll hold something, sure. These chairs are tough. Yeah. Uh, Don't drink, drink too much. <laughs> I, I thought you were supposed to be the moderator, not the enabler. <laughs> <laughs> well, there thanks. we go. Cheers. Which is the, uh, am I on? I think I'm on. Yeah? Not sure. Am I on? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So the nice thing about being a moderator is that you don't, hopefully, you don't need to talk very much at all, especially surrounded by a group of significantly smarter than me people, which is awesome. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about platforms and why, for the most part, platforms for ideation and crowdsourcing are wrong. Um, and I'm gonna start off with Bastian. Um, he's the CEO and founder of Yovoto. Why is it that crowdsourcing doesn't deliver <laughs> Decent innovation in our. Um, I guess. Or does it? We have to start way back. Um, I think uh, it's it's crowdsourcing is simple sourcing of ideas, um, people sharing thoughts. Uh, when you take it a level further, where people actually start to exchange thoughts, frame teams, and collaborate, um, it actually can be very successful. Okay more successful than, say, for instance, Christy, you're at Instructables. Mm -hmm. Have you seen significant innovation out of crowdsourced ideation? So at this point, I'm looking at both Instructables and Autodesk. And the things that I'm interested in have a large physical component. And so looking at Instructables as a crowdsourcing platform, we see things that are extremely fascinating and unexpected, which is very different from asking for a specific result. 
And I think crowdsourcing is very, very good at producing something that is, that is off the wall and unexpected, but asking it to produce a very focused, targeted result is very, very challenging. Thanks. Uh, Irving, do you have a... Irving comes from a totally different background and, and the services and, the, and what his platform actually offers are totally different. So I was wondering what you're thinking. We, we come from the world of uh, actually trying to understand the crowd and understand an, an individual. So a slightly different perspective on crowdsourcing. It's not about the individual's contribution, but understanding who that individual is and maybe how best they can contribute. And uh, just kind of looking at the, the challenges around that and, and the issue that in today's world, we, we're sort of dropping digital breadcrumbs about ourselves across all of these different platforms, uh, online and offline. And, and the more fragmented the world becomes, the more breadcrumbs we drop, the more difficult it becomes to actually understand who people really are, what, what, what their influence is, what their impact is, how can they collaborate effectively, where do they fit into that equation. And I think solving that and understanding becomes really important to build building a successful and collaborative community. Now, one of the things I'm wondering about is, and, and this is for most of the people here, is how do you extract value from that? So, you know, I think that part of understanding people effectively is, is if you can understand people, understand where people's interests lie, where their skill sets are, where they spend their time, that's how you can start to help to understand where somebody may fit in in a particular project, in a particular you know collaboration, in a particular you know, whatever that's being worked on. And the better you can understand people, where their interests lie, where their skill sets are, the more effectively you can integrate them into a larger team. I mean, because that's what essentially crowdsourcing is. It's, it's a large team of, of people from different places that aren't necessarily tied by a company, per se, or an organization. Value for whom? Value for you as a network provider, value for the other people within the community, value for those are Those are large. three or four different, very, very different exactly. questions. And not just how do you extract value from that, but how do you measure that value, right? So do you want to take that on, or do you want <laughs> me to pass it over to uh, Bastian? I mean, I think that's a good point. You don't know who uh, is the person getting the value, but I think part of our role is we're setting up the game in a way. So imagine how do you get two players in kind of the simplest game theory world to cooperate. You've got player one versus player two. And what we have to do is set up the, you know, the payoffs for these two players so they do collaborate. It's very easy to set up the game so that it's better for them to compete. So I think um, you, know, you want to have a payoff for everyone so that synergistically they get more dollars or more payoff than if they go and compete against each other. That was dumb. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Tony, by the way, he's at Columbia and he does a lot of research into this um, because you were talking about the players within the system, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's the simplest possible world where you have two people and what incentivizes them to work together. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there has to be a payoff. The payoff has to be larger when they work together than when they work separately. And what we have to do is find ways to set that up in the right environment. Um, it's not an easy challenge, but I think we have to boil it down to the smallest possible scenario. That is, you know, the, the simplest possible scenario. Certainly for academic research, we would need to. Neil, what do you think? Because you're, you're nodding your head like, yeah, I totally disagree. Um, yeah, I guess because I drank first, I'm the guy who's going to disagree with everything. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me give a little bit of context, if that's OK. So I, I both am the CEO of a company called Trata which is a crowdsourcing platform for uh, paid search advertising and Facebook advertising. I also uh, founded or co-founded uh, the Crowdsortium, which is now the trade group for crowdsourcing companies. We're one of the sponsors of the conference and have about 250 members, about 145 companies. So I spend a lot of my time uh, focused on the crowdsourcing industry and also, frankly, watching the evolution of the crowdsourcing industry. So um, I absolutely disagree that the crowd cannot produce a better result than other mechanisms. I think it's okay. So why? It's such an incredibly broad taxon. I mean, it's sort of like saying, does offshoring work? Uh -huh. Does does the freelancing work? I mean, 
in, in what context, for who, right, on the margin every single time. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a little bit of an unfair construction of the question, to be honest. Um, Bad question. I, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, I think what's happening in the crowdsourcing industry is that we're all learning a huge amount about human behavior, right? So, really, at the end of the day, when people ask me what Trotta's innovation is, uh, I say it's behavioral science. We're applying game mechanics and reputation systems and multi multimodal um, systems to what incents people, whether it's money or virtual currency or competition. If any of you have read, you know, Drive or have looked at sort of uh, Ostrom's work or any of the, the sort of stuff that talks about how people sort of act in crowds, I think actually what crowdsourcing companies are, are doing is innovating the forefront of work and trying to understand how people actually work well. Uh, I can look at a lot of marketing departments, which you could call a crowd if you wanted to, and absolutely say that they produce worse results than a crowd of well-incented individuals that have never met each other. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very hard black and white question to answer. I think a lot of it is also trying to understand uh, the evolution of the space from Wikipedia to something very complex like local motors to very expert-oriented crowd markets like Atrata or a U-Test or uh, expert bids or any of the things that you want to talk about. Um, so. Um, I'm going to sit on the other side of the camp. What do you think, Basra? Um So when we started Javoto uh, in, in Berlin at the University of Arts, uh, we had a very small group of mostly design students. Uh, it was an intimate group, and the entry barrier into collaboration was very low. Um, and we figured that uh, we can accomplish much more than um, uh, crowdsourcing sites, which at this time, end of 2006, beginning of 2007, um, we're serving um, clients, triggering market principles in order to ship cheap design labor. Um, and we as design students thought that this is not really in favor of the designer. Can we design um, and embrace crowdsourcing principles in a different way to establish a true win-win situation? Um, by growing the community, we learned that um, keeping a friendly environment and, and adding people um, allows us to solve more complex problems. Um, but only if the culture works out, and only by embracing that our business can, as a community-based business model, can only be as good as our community. So, um, yeah, crowdsourcing, if you get certain attributes right, can be very valuable for clients as well as for the, for the audience. I think it's, it's such a broad, yeah, there's such a broad set of circumstances too. Like you can think about, in some regards, like you know these group buying platforms are almost crowdsourcing, right? It's crowdsourcing deals, but at that size, you know, Groupon started with this idea of a hundred people buying opens the offer for everybody. So it's that idea of g gaining the, the participation of other people in a group to get something out of it. Whereas there's other communities which are drawing on people's just passion, a design community that says, hey, people are interested and excited about design, so they want to participate. So I think that right. there's, even within the, the word crowdsourcing, sort of Neil's point, there's so much in there. There's so many different layers. There's so many different sort of applicable definitions you could sure. have. We've seen quite a bit, uh, especially crowdsourcing within the context of the creative environment, uh, creative environment. But is there examples, solid examples, measurable examples of crowdsourcing outside of creative, outside of you know a designer, you know building, uh, making a logo or something like that? Sure. I mean, most people are familiar with you know a 99 designs or CrowdSpring or something like that, but that's actually a tiny fraction of the market. Uh, so, you know, in Trata, we help small medium sized businesses create advertising campaigns and a very small piece of that is creative. Uh, probably the first crowdsourcing company to go public will be a company called Utest that does distributed software testing. Right? So you have a mobile app and you need to localize it to 45 countries, they've got 50,000 people that do that all over the world. LiveOps is a very early participant in crowdsourcing. You know, if you call JetBlue and you talk to a rep, it's actually someone sitting at home in Kansas working off of the LiveOps crowdsource support system. You know, they're a $100 million revenue company, right? So the actual, uh, you know, with the exception maybe of 99designs, which is, which is killing it, uh, the bulk of the money being made in crowdsourcing is actually not on the graphic design side of the house. So for 99, what do you mean by I just happen to know them and I have to other numbers and they're, Right, so they're a hugely substantive company, right? And you know what, what's really important to, to take a look at is really two things in my view. One is 
the segment of the market that they focus on. So each crowdsourcing company focuses on a slightly different segment of the market, and all of us are going through a progression where, we, where we're being pulled up market. The crowdsourcing value proposition, or the expert sourcing value proposition, resonates extremely well in the small to medium-sized business uh, arena, where if you take a look at the alternatives, there aren't good alternatives. The alternative is to hire an agency, and just the assumption that the agency is gonna do a good job, good job for you is a very bad assumption. Usually agencies' payment structures are designed to actually incent the wrong way. So for example, in advertising, agencies are normally paid as a percentage of media spend, which incents them to spend your money. That's different than spending your money on what matters to you, which is the incentive structure of the product. Uh, all of our customers are what's called CPA focused, so they care about what they spent on their advertising to get a sale or to get a lead. That is the game dynamic centricity in our marketplace. It has nothing to do with how much of their money we spend. We actually do not spend 100% of our customers' money if we can't do it against their goals. You had something to say? Yeah. Um, so some, some other examples in the space. Uh, I want to get away from this digital, digital design media stuff and actually pull it back to physical objects. Is anybody here familiar with Thingiverse? It's a repository of 3D models. And so you have people making 3D designs, uploading them, uh, pulling other people's designs, modifying them, putting them back up, printing them with their home hobbyist 3D printers and uh, you actually have an open source hardware model going on live right now and th that's actually a really thriving community. Um, and then you also have things like Shapeways and Pinoco which help people get these things manufactured if they don't have access to a 3D printer. And then there's sites like custommade.com that will connect people with trades, trades persons in their area. And uh, really if you start looking at crowdsourcing what you're talking about is um, a distributed workforce, right? How do you find them, how do you connect with them, and how do you have a creative interaction with them? And uh, that's not just digital, that's also something that has a physical component. And so there are all of these other models, uh, it's a little bit more difficult simply because you need the physical infrastructure. Um, and uh, and we're, working, we're working to put together some better, uh, some better online community models and uh, interfaces online because right now they're frankly not very good um, and the tools aren't quite there, but that's work. I think that's a good point that a lot of it is also getting a good feedback mechanism through these interfaces so that other users get to see what somebody in the crowd contributed, they get to vote, you get to see what's the most popular contribution and there's kind of a self-regulating loop there. So there's a real tangible feedback of how nice is that 3D model. And many people can instantly recognize the quality and, and the good feedback. But there's many situations in crowdsourcing where it's not easy to know what is a good quality you know, crowdsourced job and what's a bad quality crowdsourced job. I mean, one example is if we went and crowdsourced you know, a question like, what's the capital of Illinois? So how many people here would say that the capital of Illinois is Chicago? How many people would say it's not Chicago? Okay, so let's say four people said it's not Chicago, but um, let's say just for the sake of you know, uh, this discussion, another four people said it was Chicago. Um, so there's a great technique called the Bayesian Truth Serum, which says, oh, well, how do we figure out what the right answer is? We just crowdsourced this, and we got four people saying Chicago and four people saying Springfield, which is the correct answer. You can also ask each person to guess what are the statistics for the crowd? And so the people who know the right answer, which is Springfield, will say, yeah, but the, I know the right answer and I know it's a toughie and I know, you know maybe 50% of the people will actually guess the wrong answer and say Chicago. Whereas the people who guessed Chicago and got it wrong would be really confident and say, actually, everyone's, everyone should say Chicago except for maybe one or two crazy people. And so I'm gonna say 99% of the crowd will agree with me. And you can do a little bit of math and look at not just the answers, but also how well the, crowd, the individual predicted the crowd as a, as a statistic. And the people who know how the crowd behaves are more likely to be saying the true answer. So it's a good way to kind of set up a feedback mechanism which figures out the true answer by using some clever Bayesian statistics. But you know, obviously we have other mechanisms like seeing what's the most popular tweet on Twitter, the most popular 3D model on Autodesk or... The but most. then don't we suffer from the probability, at least some probability, that what's most popular is not necessarily not the highest quality, right? So those who tweet the most, so for instance me, I'm close to 50,000 tweets, most of my tweets are complete horseshit. I mean, they're 
relatively vapid. It's not high quality, whatever. So how do we measure quality vis-a-vis -vis like velocity or velocity of engagement with any particular social media, right? There's a, there's a huge, I mean, this is what's fascinating about the crowdsourcing industry. There's a huge amount of work going into Quality control. So, for example, in a lot of crowdsourcing businesses, um, oh, it's back on. Maybe we should figure out which one of these is broken. Um, uh, I think mine rocks. Mine's awesome. So, um, in crowdsourcing businesses, one of the things that emerge is something called the golden question. So, let me take your example, right? So, uh, you're actually asking a, asking a contextual question. Uh, who here knows about geography, right? So if you know that that's the general context of what you're asking, you actually ask a golden question into the crowd, right? What's the capital of Seattle? Is it Tacoma or is it Olympia, right? And you actually get people to answer that. Their answer to that gives you an indication of how qualified they are in context, and that then starts to build what's mostly important, which is your reputation in context. Reputation is a fundamental emergence in uh, fundamentally important thing that's emerging in crowdsourcing businesses. It's, it's really difficult, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, it is. Uh, establishing reputation and especially expertise or authority within any particular domain, that's one of the hard things to do, at least I think, for any crowdsource to. Well, and, and also right. the thing that you, again, this is, this is the area of do you know more about geography? Do you know more about, say, computer science, right? So. So establishing one reputation is, is somewhat irrelevant. Um, I'm particularly interested in things like reputation portability because... But also molecular gastronomy. Uh, yes, yes, but... So how uh, do we establish no, your relative... The thing is I have, I have a uh, weird collection of things that I am expert in, right? And, uh, and so looking at something like, say, my academic pedigree is not going to tell you a darn thing about what I do right now. Um, but that's, that's one of the standard measures of reputation. But um, being able to look at things on a, a variety of different scales, right? Uh, maybe if you're talking about, say, activity in a crowdsourced community, um, you can look at uh, measures of activity. You can look at measures of, uh, say, external validation, right? Did I do this for a client? How did the client rate me? How do people within rate me? But being able to have multiple axes to analyze the data is relevant, but also the ability to pull in reputation from other places that I might be active. Um, I, I would love this to be platform agnostic. Data portability is really hard. Uh, social graph data portability because everybody's squatting on their own piece of uh, data. Facebook does not let you move things easily, right? That, being that's able a, to pull your reputation and your authority take it with your expertise you. take it with, with you. you. Right? Yeah, and that's it's very hard because everybody wants to own the data. <laughs> I mean, I think so that there's, there's a danger in reputation portability, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it matters a lot the context in which you, it matters a lot, it matters a lot in which the context in which you build your <laughs> reputation, right? So, I mean, and, and to some people, reputation doesn't matter uh, as much. Other things matter more. I'm not saying one is better or the worst. The thing I was chuckling at is, there's three people from MIT on the side of the panel, and the two are wearing brass rats, right? So, you guys, reputation with, matters. That's why you wear it. MIT. I, I don't. I don't. Who are the three from MIT? You guys are wearing brass rats. Yeah. Right. So, uh, who's the third? That's, that's a, me. Oh, yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I only four. wear mine for conferences. Uh, my, my point was, for some people, reputation is a motivator, right? And that's. And I'm not saying there's anything bad about that. It's, it's phenomenal. But for other people, there are other things that matter, and there's other demonstrations of, mm -hmm. of your reputation. So like that portability, for example, the brass rat in Trata would have nothing to do with a predictor. Does everybody here first know about the brass rat? Just to make everything. So it's just a ring with it's a, it's a people, really big ugly ring a, a that you can see at a distance. People graduated from a technical school, which is really nothing more than glorified carpentry. Um, they wear a badger or a beaver. rat or a beaver, beaver. on the, yes exactly uh, on the, on the but, but the point being mine is the result of a degree in biology yeah. does that matter yeah. I mean to, to me that means it's a degree in problem solving but in nevertheless of, again it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the question of what does a reputation actually mean in context right that's all that I'm saying so I mean I trust me I went through the same <laughs> yes. programs I know how complicated it is but it has nothing to do with my qualifications <laughs> crowdsourcing and in advertising, right? So Nothing. reputation is a very dangerous thing to make for yeah. them, right? Which is why what crowd, crowdsourcing, I think crowdsourcing is actually siloing itself up. So take a look at, for example. What do you mean sil siloing itself siloing up? Siloing itself up. So if you look at a company like Stack Exchange, so Stack Exchange is a 
was a or Stack Overflow, site, but yeah. Right? And it was a very popular developer site where developers would go in and answer questions. I think it's still pretty popular. I mean, it's not like it's declining. It's not like it's much more popular. But what they learned is that they needed to actually subsegment out the sites, and you now actually have Stack Exchange, which is a series of siloed community sites. This is sort of similar to what's happening in Quora and things like this, where you establish your reputation in every single uh, one of these, these uh, genres. So if you, you're a Ruby on Rails programming expert or a C++ programming expert or a, you know, whatever, nuclear physics uh, expert. And so you are getting these very, very solid reputations. And I think that's what's happening. I don't know if it's the right thing or the wrong thing, but at least that's what's mm -hmm. happening to your point. Because being, a rep being uh, reputable in one area does not necessarily translate into Irving, I thought I heard you. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, I know this is varying a little bit, but that's the problem with like the, the services like Clout and these other, these other services out there that are trying to pin a single numerical figure or a single way to define your reputation because it, it sort of presupposes that your influence, your impact, your reputation around one category is exactly the same as it is around another, which is ultimately completely untrue. And so, the, you know, the ability to be effective in, in any kind of community or crowdsourcing community, it's dependent on a number of different variables. It's, a, it's really that truly multivariate equation that changes depending on where you are, what you're looking at, what you're trying to accomplish, etc. And if it's just one number, then people start to game it. So just like you know, page rank was pretty important, and then eventually some websites figured out how to hmm. change our link structure, and then their page rank score went up. They started gaming it, and then it started becoming not such a useful tool at Google, and they had to you know, engineer around it. So one metric is always very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So one measure we, we did was um, to support ownership of the individual. Um, but just to over give a little, before you, just to give a little background for what Bussin and the Javolta platform have done, they've spent a lot of time thinking, at least from my initial understandings, thinking about how do you measure reputation, how do you measure contribution, how do you measure, and how do you potentially game yeah. positive um, contributions into, the, into that platform, right? So in our platform, uh, work results compete while the talent uh, and the workers collaborate. Um, we handed over the payment decision to, to the collective audience. Um, we said it shouldn't be the clients or it shouldn't be us deciding about um, who earns which amount. Um, and this is forcing us to constantly update our algorithms to stay ahead of the crowd because of, of course they're trying to game the system. And people and, are trying to game their own reputation and they're yeah. trying to game their contributions, right? Um, uh, reputation is very, very important. Um, also, community management, educating everyone that this only works if you embrace um, that it's a community in the true sense of the word community. Um, so it's much more powerful to educate the community um, about what's the right behavior here to support the, uh, overall, the, the overall model than to update your algorithms. We also have a yeah, by now a pretty tweaked true ways estimate this algorithm. We adopted some Shannon Weaver based models and it's um, it's really a complex mix out of um, building culture, supported through tools, algorithms and community management in order to um, grow this overall endeavor um, in the interest of everyone. And uh, it's it's not easy to keep this balance. But at the end, we, uh, we created an engine to not only evaluate uh, the performance of work results within the process, but also evaluate the performance of talent. Um, and because people are truly um, owning what they do, and they spend like six to 10 hours on the platform, a lot of the people, um, per week? they trigger a vast week? amount of events a day. Um, they six to 10 hours per, per day. Yeah, they, it's, for them it's a workplace. We have uh, members in the platform where we pay out fifty, sixty thousand uh, dollars annually, and they, it's, it's like five percent of the community. But they treat it as workspace, um, and they uh, really, uh, for them, reputation is important. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, the the algorithms that allow us to um, evaluate talent, um, for example, tell us. If somebody's a good team player or not, if his feedback or that? is constructive and appreciated by the other community, if the feed feedback is facilitated or not, and um, this is not only reflected in the work results and the performance of the results, but also in the appreciation of the individual within the community. So, uh, and we we haven't even shoot through a tiny part of the data we generate. <laughs> I think this is why you, you can't have complete transparency either in all this stuff. I mean. 
fa I was fascinated the story. One of the people I work with has yeah, friends at graduate school at NYU and sent an email to this huge list saying, "Hey, we are part of our grade is going to be dependent on our club score this year. So, we, uh, if you wouldn't mind, connect with me on all these links. I'm going to be tweeting a lot and posting a lot on Instagram and LinkedIn. And if you wouldn't mind liking every one of my posts and retweeting, etc., that would be really help me for my grade. Now, that, that's to me kind of the definition of inauthenticity, not a true measurement of, of anything about somebody. So, I, I think like it or not, to the extent that you're willing to expose a lot of these tools and me ways of measuring reputation, you know, Tony, to your point, like, people are going to figure out how to game it. They're going to figure out how to. that point, to, I mean, to your point, has anybody else here in the audience been exposed to this kind of douchebaggery? <laughs> I mean, because it's kind of do you, bullshit, right? Do you mean? Uh, it's like, we're going to measure you by these random element or these random metrics by which you're going to engage in bad behavior. We know you're going to re engage in bad behavior, and we're okay with that. Well, I, I don't think that creating systems to be gamed is inherently bad because creating a, the structure of the site or the system allows you to align people's interests. Unfortunately, in this case, what you're talking about with clout, I, I do find clout useful because if anyone ever cites their clout score to me, I can write them off immediately. Um, uh, by the way, mine's 59, so. Bye. Uh, um, <laughs> in a non-ironic fashion. Um, but in terms of designing, designing the interface on the site, that is, that's really key because you're saying, I've created this system, I want you to do this. Right, or I want everything to move in this direction, so I'm going to create the systems so, because I know you're going to game systems, especially early adopters online are all crazy system gamers. And um, so, so if you structure it well, you can take advantage of that fact. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to be opaque about it. You can say, this is what we're going to reward. And if you do it well and you do it right, maybe you have a wide variety of different metrics and you can say, in this case, we're going to reward um, this behavior. But and then in this case, we're going to reward this behavior so you can optimize for different directions. Within any one of these platforms, though, how do you create a system that rewards positive, real, substantive contribution? You can also just whack anything that's negative. You can say, you know, we or, have a community create, management like system. Like what you guys did on Instructables, which is create the echo chamber, which is. Yeah, so I'm we, a, we can say basically if you're being a troll, we're going to we're gonna get rid of this, no one else is going to see it, right? Because that, that behavior is not allowed on this system. And uh, which is different, it's different from saying we're only going to reward good behavior, it's going to be, you know, we're going we're gonna to remove bad behavior. And to some extent, that's a self-perpetuating cycle because if people don't see bad behavior, they won't mimic it. You, know, you had a comment? I mean, it's, a lot of these metrics are really fundamentally broken. They're better than nothing because at least it makes us think about how to improve ourselves and whatever you know this metric is supposed to be reaching for. But I mean, look at FICO scores, right? Your credit scores, it's fundamentally broken. Um, some people are, you know, one silly thing, you forget to pay one bill because you were traveling somewhere and then your FICO score takes a massive hit. And then the whole industry knows it's broken. Banks will kind of roll their eyes at it, but they'll still use it at the end because having something is better than nothing. So no metric means chaos, whereas really bad metrics that can be gamed, at least it's, you know, helping us figure out, you know, what's, what's, at, the, what's at stake, what's at the table. But at least in that case, people know the rules. Do they really, though? I mean, it's still a little bit of a black art with the FICO score thing. So, I mean, I think the, what fascinates me about the discussion that always emerges around crowdsourcing is that people approach it as if it's something new. Right, so all of you have probably looked at a resume. So what you're about to say is that it's not. Yeah, so it's fundamental. all of you have looked at a resume. Try to argue that people don't game their resumes. Oh, They're we all know that resumes every are time they write a resume. crap, right? We're very, very used to this. Let, they'll look at a counterexample. So um, many of you might not know this, but in, in Google, when, when the ads show up on the top on the right-hand side, it's not based purely on how much someone's willing to pay. Google has a, an effective reputation score built into their, um, their bidding system called Quality Score. And Quality Score has a whole bunch of attributes that they look at. Uh, the relevance of what's on the website versus the ad, how fast the website is, all sorts of other things. And what you pay is actually a cross product of what you're willing to bid and how good your quality score is. If, if you remember Google four or five or six years ago, you would click on an ad. The ad, first of all, would have no relevance whatsoever to what you typed in. Or you would click on the ad and you would go to some domain parking site with just a whole bunch of other ads. 
you probably, if you think about it, notice that that doesn't happen very much anymore. That's because Google introduced the concept of quality score and they basically punish people from a pricing perspective if they don't want to follow the rules. So we're all the beneficiary of these systems that are going on all the time. I think really the kind of the, the heady concept for me is, at the end of the day, it's a little bit of what you were saying, like what kind of a world do you want to live in? I want to live in a world of meritocracy. And I believe that we live in a world of unprecedented me measurement and it's got complications. We build algorithms, we tweak them, people game them, especially when money is at stake, you know, people are much more incentive to try to find loopholes around them. But I fundamentally believe that creating a meritocracy, especially around work, and as a side note, if people don't think this is coming back into work, give it two years. So Salesforce just bought Ripple, they have Chatter, I helped start a company that- And Chatter's, by the way, is kind of crap, but- It's early, <clears throat> though, right? Alta Vista was crap, it is. right? So, right. I mean, it gets better. But you know, I fundamentally believe that we should live in a, work, in a world that is meritocratic from a work perspective because that just drives so much better behaviors and so much more happiness in the workforce. Mm. It's better than the way it was. So the question that I have really for a couple of you is if you're as old as me, you remember the heady days of 1995, 1996. I was just at MIT and we were focused on knowledge management. How is this fundamentally different from knowledge management? How is it better? Is it? Or not. Neil, come on. Stand up. Oh, what was I doing in 1995? Um, I was in the, in the cluster. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was making up. Um, I, I, I don't know that much about knowledge management, so I can't say. So, why are fun, uh, crowdsourcing systems better than? I think fundamentally because we have the tools to collaborate in a way that we didn't before. That are much more social or no? Um, well, I think there are much more many things. So social is a good example, reputation is a good, good example, competitive. Most crowdsourcing systems deploy a huge amount of different behavioral mechanics, right? And, and that's actually what makes them work a lot better than the old way of doing things. I mean, take a traditional work example. Most people inside of a company uh, and, and the sales side are compensated only based on what they produce, right? It's a, it's a single dimensional um, compensation system. They're not compensated on all the other subtleties that go along with being a salesperson. Uh, so while Chatter is maybe in its infancy and Ripple, which Salesforce bought, is in its infancy, what that's doing is it's introducing other behavioral mechanics into a selling system, which is, say for example, a salesperson is not necessarily motivated by how much money they make, but they're motivated by getting the most number of sales in a month even if they were smaller. We deployed these game mechanics inside of our own sales team. And some people perform phenomenally when you actually incent them in something not purely on money. The end result is money, but they're not there for that. You put up leaderboards, you write them on the wall, you give people badges when they get four demos a day on, on the phone, those kinds of things. We do a lot of this stuff we have traditionally, but it's been very one-dimensional before, and now we're getting a lot smarter about you know, um, behavioral economics and behavioral science, and crowdsourcing companies, I think, are really leading the charge on that. I think one of the, the other pieces that maybe it's staying the obvious, but it's the real time nature of the world we live in now that makes a huge difference, right? It's a, you can collaborate much more effectively now that results and collaboration can be seen in the real time. You can post something up and immediately people can see it. They can comment. You can see mm -hmm. their comments. You can engage in a conversation and a discussion in real time collaboration from a, a number of different places. That that fundamental change, and that wasn't really an option even you know 10 years ago, it was just beginning to be an option. And that change is the way people can collaborate from afar. I mean, before, collaboration meant you know, in organizations because that was the only place you could put people in teams with real-time discussion. Now that can happen anywhere and anyhow. Well, I would say the thing that keeps coming up out, out of all of these panels is flexibility. Flexibility in terms of time, flexibility in terms of location, flexibility in terms of you know, even what, what tool you're choosing to use, right? Mobility. Again, that's another form of flexibility. And so this, is, this, gives, this gives more control both to the person who's performing the work, the person who is, who is uh, benefiting from this, well, all the people who are benefiting from this work. Because again, I want to get away from that one-to-one -one employer employee model. You know, some of this is I'm doing work, I'm sharing it with the world, I'm open sourcing it, right? The idea of open source hardware is one of the, how many people here are familiar with Adafruit? If you don't know about this, they're in Brooklyn. They do open source hardware kits in uh, usually electronics, but they are absolutely killing. Uh, Lamour was on the front cover of Wired a couple months ago uh, talking about the maker movement. But um, it's a fantastic model for um, 
people, people making a real, they have something like 10 employees now. This is a real business based around open source hardware and it only works because of the online tools that are available. And that level of flexibility is absolutely amazing. Um, actually, actually they're in Manhattan, not Brooklyn, sorry. What's that? No, I just wanted to interject one thing, which is um, I, going on the record, hate panels. I think it's bullshit. And I would like to take some questions from the audience. I think Alan has a couple of ideas that have been kind of burning up within his soul <laughs> that he wants to share with us. No, I, I just feel like we can have a, a, a more open conversation about most of the people here in this room, I, at least more than 50% I've met, they're smarter than me. I want to hear from them. I want to hear from you, Alan. Uh, in our experience, it's, it's really, it's very industry specific, it's generational. There are a lot of creative people who just are very uh, hung up on IP and they don't like to share and they like to show things when they're done. Um, and that they have a habit of working alone. And, uh, and then there are other people, Bastian and I were discussing this earlier, who love to share and to show process and to engage. Mm -hmm. And um, so some of this is like sort of customs of uh, various you know, industries or verticals and some of it's generational. And I think that as crowdsourcing platforms become more innovative, more exciting, more versatile, uh, where different media come in, where you can actually share in ways using video, video testimonials, other kinds of media, that it becomes such a, like a rich platform um, that people who uh, just sort of have a negative prejudice to it right, right out of the gate will have a different, there'll just be a different argument soon. Uh, it's not now, for, it's have not you for, experienced over, um, I mean, because you're one of the, one of the people over at Core 77, mm -hmm. what have you experienced in terms of the way that people are willing to do that? We see an, an extraordinary divide. Uh, mm -hmm. People who just aren't interested in sharing and, uh, and are very, very um, concerned with intellectual property. Um, we had a similar experience, um, especially when professional older talent joins this rather young community. Um, their perception of ownership of copyright is, is pretty established and this does not really uh, get along well with the kind of culture of collaboration we nurture on our platform. So a huge part of our job is just education, um, explaining why shared ownership uh, can also be very beneficial for everyone. Um, and yeah, because I think we started with a very intimate community, we had the right culture from the beginning on and just made sure that it, um, it, that it keeps on going and when new people join in the community educate. Um, but it's it's a huge problem and copyright law is really not living up to this this culture of collaboration. Yeah, I mean it's just really. stuff is moving so quick. You know, the other thing that you find that comes up in all of these panels is is the is no spec, right? It's like you know, graphic design for instance, there's just a huge community of people who don't believe in spec work. When you look at uh, industries like advertising and architecture, you know, screenwriting, I mean there are entire industries that are only spec. Right? You only get paid when it's, when it's sold. You, you always show all of it first. So this is, this is problematic for me personally. I just, I, I can't even wrap my head around like how this isn't okay in certain industries and absolutely fundamental to many others. So one thing that I think is really interesting uh, that's happening um, in crowdsourcing marketplaces, and we do this specifically in Trotta, but it's happening elsewhere, is there's a whole bunch of industries that forever have never participated in the value that their work created. So take graphic design, right? So the famous Nike swoosh example or the iHeart New York logo, you know, the designers never made any money from that, right? Um, the early days of crowdsourcing graphic design companies were all contest model, right? So you get paid out one time. Actually, in um, uh, one of the things that we did in, in, uh, in Trada when we launched our Facebook product is we actually separated the people sort of targeting the users on Facebook and the kind of the thinking behind that and the people actually making the ads, the actual graphic design creative. But we bound them together in the earning contract. And so what happens is a graphic designer makes an ad. If one of the people targeting someone on Facebook with that ad uses the ad and then they get paid every click, every sale, et cetera, a part of that goes actually back to the graphic designer. So for the first time, the graphic designer is actually getting a royalty 
effectively off of what they generate for the advertiser who's paying for it on an ongoing basis. So we're very similar in the sense that people work in our marketplace as full-time jobs. We have our highest earners make almost $200,000 a year. We have many people at the $65,000 level. That's sort of our definition of full-time equivalent. And we're getting this huge graphic design community growing up because they can build a portfolio of assets that actually monetize for them when they're asleep, literally. And that's a very different uh, evolution of valuing someone, and it changes their perspective on spec. They will do work if they get an ongoing revenue stream. The big argument against spec and graphic design is, I do all this work for you and I win 1% of contests, whatever the case may be, I think that's a bad use of my time. But if you win 1% of effective contests, although it's a much higher trata, you can actually get paid out for a long period of time. Actually, they would argue that their biggest argument is that it devalues the profession. So let's just get into that. So I don't think it actually devalues the profession because what, I mean, in, in our model, what happens is if you've created something that creates value, you earn the value for it. So it's quite the opposite. We actually revalue the graphic designer in a way they've never been valued before. Even if you're How's working that? at $100 an hour. What do you mean they've never been valued before? Let's say you're working at an agency and you're working at $100, $200 an hour as a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. You're making unbelievable ad copy or banner ads or television commercials or whatever. It's nice to earn money while you're asleep. It's nice to earn money while you're asleep, but so you're still making $200 no matter how, how much you make or how good it is. In our model, and there's other companies that are sort of following this model through, you actually get the ongoing residual royalty for what you... How do you punish people or companies for situations which is rampant right now, which is somebody creates some valuable you know, creative or ad or whatever it is, and uh, their work is appropriated and they never get compensated with it? So, I think. Uh, sorry. Um, how do you create a situation where creative people who have done this work, done amazing copy or amazing creative, and they produce this and sure. put it up on one of these things, and um, they never get compensated for it? Their work is appropriated, they get nothing. We see very little of that in, in our marketplace, and part of it's just the function of the type of work. People aren't doing project work. They're building campaigns that run forever, and so they have a relationship with the crowd. Everybody uses their real name. And so if they were to take the work and go away, they then wouldn't have the crowd doing the daily optimization, so they would be back to square one. So we see that very, very rarely, like 0.1% you know, of the time. It has happened, but very rarely, and at a level that no one really complains about. They'll take the risk with everything else. You had a question? Yeah, uh, on a slightly different track, it's, I've just been wondering to myself, and I'm wondering if you can answer, um, if, if platform follows task or task follows platform. So in other words, um, I belong to one crowdsourcing wiki site called VeloBase that tracks the history of obscure bike parts. And so in that case here, the person who created the site said, I want to track this stuff and use the crowd to do it and build the site. So in that case, platform follows task. But we've also been talking, I believe, about platforms that then, the nature of the platform enables better efficient crowdsourcing of multiple different tasks. So my question to you guys is, which direction do you think is best to come at this? Platform and then how? A platform that works for multiple tasks or you know, a platform for a task. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, <laughs> Way too many, Chris. <laughs> Way too many. Um, so so uh, I would strongly say you take your task and then you go find the platform. So for example, wikis. Wikis are spectacular if there is an answer that everyone can agree on, right? You can agree that this bike part came out in this year, it was this type, it had these features. Um, however, one of, the, one of the reasons that Instructables is explicitly not a wiki is it is a personal storytelling engine. So my, my favorite example is if you have a wiki for how to make a haunted house, you will average to mediocrity. However, I would rather have a thousand different stories of here's the haunted house I made you know, on my front porch for my kids, right? So that's a very different thing, 
a storytelling platform versus a let's go find the absolute truth platform. And so, of course, one can expand that and say, you know, there are other types of platforms that suit other goals, but, uh, but that's one very clear-cut example for when a wiki is not the solution for everything. So I would strongly say you start with your concept and then you go find a platform to either use or modify for your goal. I would only add one thing, which is, and we can talk about this offline or outside of this, which is how do you normalize that data? Is normalizing the data, at least for me, is really important because how do you recommend, how do you create synergies between people that are all without some kind of data normalization, right? If it's all just, you know, I'm doing this and it's fucking awesome. Well, that, at that point, you're talking about a variety of things. You're talking about how do you identify quality content, right. how do you surface that quality content, how do you deliver it to the person who's looking for it? Right. And those are really, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> Especially anyway. as you start getting a a larger data set. You were saying, uh, sorry, Neil, I saw you kind of uh, No, I, I think a huge difference in crowdsourcing approaches are those that are attempting to make one thing with ultimate truth, as you said, mm -hmm. that's why Wikipedia is successful, or those that are trying to make a lot of things, or those that are trying to bubble up the best thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably three very different tasks. There are crowdsourcing platforms out there. I think they work well for just general collaborative ideation. Everybody I know that is sort of a category leader in the crowdsourcing space has absolutely designed their platform to be very specific to the task. And then has, uh, what they've started to do as well, is, and we've done this too, is they then started to discretize different parts <coughs> of the overall process. So in the beginning, we had someone that made a, made a paid search campaign. And then it becomes someone that makes the, the keywords and the bid prices, and then someone who makes the ad copy. And then we rip out the landing page part, and someone does the landing page, and then we rip out the graphical copy. And, that's sort of happening in a lot of the crowdsourcing spaces. They're starting mm -hmm. to take the assembly line and chop it up and put extensions for people in their markets that want to do just one slice of it and do it very well. Well, and then the other thing that this jumps into is the concept of siloing, right? So to some extent, you have all of these little verticals for, you know, this is a, a crowdsourcing site for graphic design. This is a crowdsourcing site for designing a car. And I personally really love the, the, the fascinating overlaps that happen in the margins. And so that means that on my website, we specifically do not silo. We encourage people to cross-pollinate. And in fact, that has borne fruit in the fact that we have all the weird stuff that, that you get from these collaborations. And you can actually build family trees of this led to this, led to this, led to this, and people will 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 uh, you know credit and link and things like that. Um, and we make that fairly straightforward. But just to, just to say in terms of structuring, again, if your goal is to create a silo, then that's great, but so many of these platforms force you into siloing. And I, f I personally find that to be uh, dangerous if you don't do it intentionally. Well, speaking of siloing and uh, crowdsourcing, well, siloing in the context of, of siloing, I wanted to reach out to Toby because I thought um, he, being the founder of Social Media Week, is very, he's, day in and day out focused on how do you create all these various concepts or various you know constructs within every city where each one has their own their own ideas or whatever but each one is kind of unique in how do you design a viable way of delivering value to the people that are going to service that so i just wanted to ask toby what do you think uh, I had a, like a really well prepared question as well, so I didn't realize you were going to call on me. So no. you should you should have been here earlier. So Will. I, I shouldn't have even talked. I, I, I should have I, just sat back and said, "I delivered oh, a two-hour crowd I... here. Talk to Toby <laughs> because he's fantastic." Um, I mean, so we talked a little bit about this earlier uh, in terms of sort of how we architect uh, a global city, a, a global conference that happens in, in multiple cities simultaneously. And um, you're right, every single market is different, every set of teams are different, but they generally follow a, 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 the same kind of methodology of um, you know, forming core, tightly focused, highly skilled and passionate um, uh, teams um, that then working outwards from that build layers of um, uh, collaborators um, out to the sort of the fringes of the broader community to enable um, you know highly effective and highly efficient collaboration to get a whole manner of different things done but but I, I want to just like flip that into a question that I had for, for all of you guys 
Um, so I subscribe to the idea that, that good collaboration starts in the home. Um, and uh, earlier on, that the previous talk, in fact, touched upon this idea of overlapping teams. And how do you internally create efficiencies in the collaboration process? Um, and what tools do you use to create efficiencies in the collaboration process to ensure that your teams operating internally to enable and facilitate broader and wider community led collaboration. Um, so interesting to kind of hear your, your various different perspectives on that. Yeah, so you were actually supposed to offer an example or a good not uh, ask a question of us. I, I, so I can what, I can hop what, into this so, one. So <laughs> sorry, Toby. Uh, <laughs> but I should have been here my, earlier. My my answer is uh, Frequently when you have collaboration, one of the things that we've discovered is um, collaboration is very, very weird. Um, <laughs> so so some of, some of the, the websites that are specifically built to enable collaboration, um, I feel like they, they more allow inspiration and passing something back and forth. Right? To me, collaboration is something hap that happens more so when you're co-localized, and you can then work on the, right, but working on the same project and bouncing something back and forth, we can call it collaboration, but it's, it's a different creature. Um, one of the fascinating things to me is we built a collaboration tool on Instructables five years ago. Biggest waste of dev resources ever because no one uses it in that fashion. Um, what they instead do is say, here are my projects, here are your projects, here's another account for our projects together, right? And they both, they both access that account and they, you know, they, both, they both do the thing together. Um, in Instructable's case, usually that's something that they've done offline, and then, but they're collaborating on the storytelling piece. But what that boils down to me is uh, that collaboration and ownership and attribution are very important. So maybe at some point, and maybe not here tonight, but we're going to talk about how do we define collaboration because I definitely, yeah, Christy and I were talking about yeah. when she came into my office yesterday. You know, when I was at MIT, we had a small group of, I don't know, 100 engineers. We had 175 bulletin boards within our system mm -hmm. to talk about the stuff that we were doing. And so clearly no innovation happened there, but the point being that everybody addresses the way that they collaborate and they connect and they have conversations with mm -hmm. differently depending on a different context or whatever. And that might be very different for engineers versus artists versus architects versus... versus marketing people and sales people. Right. And so I'm, I'm definitely talking about a subset, but I, I do think it touches on something that's very key, which is the issue of mechanism and, and ownership and attribution. Okay. Uh, referring to Toby's question, I think um, you have to get the culture right and the values right if you start with internal um, collaboration and then you expand into a broad audience. Um, so we learned that, um, first of all, you have to establish a positive culture. Uh, you have to build trust um, based on tr transparency, respect, openness. And, um, and then it's fairly easy to tap into a broader audience because you have an established culture and this is to a certain extent contagious and um, people just appreciate it so much that they um, keep their own garden clean. Um, so they help people to understand how the process works and um, realize that the more complex, the more wicked a problem is, um, the better this system works to tap into external um, broader audiences. Um, for example, the $300 house, like solving um, a problem that focuses on, on housing solutions for the poor, um, which is a problem that can be tackled from like uh, it feels like a gazillion angles, but um, we learned that um, connecting our tiny community to architecture communities, to engineering communities, um, is, is, is then the right approach. And so you don't think about task and platform, it's just um, you have to get the culture right, and then it doesn't matter what kind of task um, you work on because you can connect external audiences. Yes, thank you, Vashan. Um, you had a point that you wanted to bring up? Yeah. It's a question, actually. So, um, <clears throat> and directed at one of us, just so it's not like free for all. I'd rather it be a free for all, actually. <laughs> you all get, get in there. Um, so, the question's about uh, social influence and the wisdom of crowds. So, if you're talking about accurate information extraction, 
uh, it seems to me that having independent opinions uh, from the crowd creates more accurate result from a from a crowdsourced question because well, of herding. Well, it all kind of depends on how you define that, right? Right. So that I mean, that's what you, I want. That's what so I want to ask. First, you. define what do you mean by influence, right? Yeah. So if if so so if prob a, probability of amplification might be one variable that you could at least say, okay, we're going to do this and we can measure it. So. Right, if I wanted to ask the crowd a question and try to m increase the probability that I would get the correct answer, like if there was a truth to the question, um, and the assumption is, or the evidence that I've seen is that if those uh, opinions are independent, you're more likely to get the correct answer. Mm -hmm. but, the, but influence can also be very useful in crowds for motivation, for directing the crowd in appropriate ways, etc. So how do you handle the positives and the negatives of keeping things independent or interdependent in terms of using social influence to improve the wisdom of crowds or avo avoiding it when you want to do something else? One of the, um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that we've witnessed, and there's a lot written about this uh, in the crowdsourcing space, is this issue of uh, sort of work independence. We actually don't allow users that are working on the same project to see each other's work. Uh, once you allow them to actually like look behind the curtain of each other's work, it drives absolutely to the common denominator. There's a lot of like, there was a you mean lowest company, common. a financial uh, sort of website that used you know crowds to pick stocks and stuff, and they actually showed the data to everybody, and like all the portfolios tanked. It was a big problem. Um, so you have to find this really intricate balance between the firewalls, but also the summarization of results that don't necessarily lend influence to people, but they lend motivation to people. So we, for example, take all the results on an individual's campaign. So there's 10 advertising experts working on an advertiser's campaign. We will take all of their results and show them in a leaderboard. And so you can compare things like, what, how well am I doing, how well am I performing, relatively speaking, but also we show some subtle cues, like in our world, how many keywords have I come up with for this campaign? How many ads have I written? So there's signals as to what is good work or good results, but there's not definitive, I can't see the keyword, I can't see the ad. And we play with that balance constantly. Um, but when we have exposed everything, um, for example, when we take an advertiser's, when we take an advertiser's existing campaign, we actually rip it apart and remove the structure from it that you have to build inside of Google, and we give it to everybody in a normalized flat structure, and we make them remix it. Because if we don't, they will just take the best stuff and I'll put it in, right? Which is human nature, right? So uh, it's, it's a very delicate answer, but definitely not complete transparency. That's what I've learned. Well, so basically what you're describing is the role of a community manager, right? And so the, the previous panel talking about how everyone in the company has a community management role, right? Some of the things that you're describing are structural. And that's why uh, you know, the development team and the, uh, and the marketing team and the, and the people who are actually hands-on in that, dis you know, actually, actually dealing with the community as well are all doing community management. Right, because it's, it's big picture and it's again, how do, you, how do you structure it to achieve the goal that you're looking for? So what do you think? Peter, sorry, can we get the, uh, I want to know what Peter Gerber thinks, because he's been doing this for the last couple of years. What do you think, Peter? You think it's horseshit? What do you, what do you have to add? You have to think of the last question. Yeah. The problem with me being the moderator is that I know a lot of you, and I'm going to call on you. <laughs> no, I'm not going to call. Um, so it's about evaluating talent. You know, I think for like a long path about evaluating talent, I thought for a long time that um, you know, the ultimate evaluation is how much we pay somebody. At the end of the day, you know, payments is one of the ultimate gaming dynamics. You know, people are doing something, you say you're good, so I'm going to pay you a lot of money. Um, well, you can pay in things that aren't cash. Sorry? You can pay in things that aren't cash. Well, that's what I'm interested about. So your best thing said there's 5% of people that get paid out. You know, there's 95% of people that are still using the system. They're deriving value somehow. I'm interested to hear what that value is and how you support that other value that people are deriving. Well, un unless those people are like the uh, millions of people who play the lottery. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that, that could be the case. 
I mean, there was a nice study by Duncan Watts, um, you know, who's written a great book called Everything is Obvious, but where they looked at incentives and s tried to see how incentives correlate with, you know, the quality of the output of, you know, a crowdsourced task. And it turns out it's not very, uh, you know, it's not, the relationship isn't that obvious. And in fact, people always, so if you pay someone, you know, a dollar for a minute's worth of work and you pay someone else $10 for that minute's worth of work and then somebody else $20, turns out everybody always thinks they're underpaid and they all think they're underpaid by about, you know, 20% too low. And so it's, um, there are some studies which show that larger financial compensation doesn't necessarily produce better quality crowdsourcing. I'm, I don't know the exact uh, journal article, but Duncan Watts is one of the authors. We see, uh, for example, the people that are kind of in the $500 to $1,000 a month in terms of what they earn, um, they do it for a number of reasons. One is uh, they probably do uh, paid search at an agency for a living, and they have got to work on one campaign for the last two years. I'm working on the target campaign, and they actually happen to like paid search, but we have such a broad market, they can go work on small business women's fashion, or they can go work on finance. They can just sort of experience a different sort of segment of an of a activity that they like. Um, that's a very common one. We actually find, um, find the optimizers in our community seeking each other out and looking for community. Some are there just to talk and trade secret, uh, trade sort of information. And then actually, really surprisingly, um, if you go on LinkedIn, you'll find people list Trada on the resume. I was super shocked by this because I got two resumes in one week with Trada actually on the resume. So some people, and, and they weren't our highest earners by any means, but they had achieved a level, which is sort of a quality of work assessment in our system. Uh, that allowed them to go out and acquire more work or better reputation or maybe a better payment in their own job if they argued to their, their boss, hey, I've proven myself in the system, I can do better. Uh, I also, I, I wrote a piece a long time ago called Crowdsourcing is the New Internship. You know, it's like, why, you know, why go intern for one company when you can work for all of them, right? And you can have that experience. And a friend of mine who runs a company called Victors and Spoils, which is a very sort of high-end ad agency that does very sort of disruptive <coughs> Harley Davidson, et cetera, they see a lot of people that are very good at what they do, but would never in a traditional agency get to go work on a Harley Davidson campaign, come in just to see the interaction that they have with the actual account managers to learn about that process five or 10 years before they would ever be able to see that by working through the traditional agency mechanism. That alone is worth, even if they make nothing from it, just getting the feedback from someone that is proxying Harley Davidson is incredibly valuable for them. So it's, it's really fascinating. Um, how I would say th there's an old test called the Bartle test, which is based on um, why people play like World of Warcraft and things like that. And they sort of, it's social, are you an explorer, or do you look for achievements, are you a mercenary, you want to sort of kill people and make money. And what he found was very surprisingly that few people do it for the money and, and uh, killing people side of things. And most people do it for a primary reason and a secondary reason, and there's a huge amount of permutations of those. It's actually an interesting study to go look at, but it's always, Ask people at work, why are you at this job? I like my boss. Yeah. So Have a great view. Do I believe in a meritocracy? You said earlier that you'd like to, that's, that's a, you'd like to believe that that's a possibility, but knowing that about people, I would like to believe that too. Sure. But I'm the nature of humans. Well, but see, here's my, here's my thinking, right? So if you are doing something for a reason that you like, I, I'm doing it because I enjoy the social aspect. I'm doing it because I like competition. The end result of your work will be better, and thus the meritocracy works, right? So that, that's the thinking, is that that's the catalyst to getting the good result. Not because I'm, to your point, I paid you $5, $10, $20, that doesn't get better work. All the studies say that doesn't get better work. But if someone's very social and you give them social interaction around the work, they'll take a dollar and they'll get better results. So assuming they don't have any degree of Asperger's. Assuming they don't have any degree of I'm gonna I'm gonna make one proposal. So um, I've seen if you get enough MIT people with alcohol, um, <laughs> <clears throat> it's not the kind of stuff you want to leave on a stage for too long. Um, no. So what I'm what I'm gonna propose is so I, I don't want to. There's a lot of interesting stuff we can discuss, but I'm gonna propose that we do it in a bar because we're sort of halfway there with uh, Will's, Will's uh, start to the panel. Um, so first, thanks, Will, and thanks, thanks to everyone. Um,